Hi, Alan Stratton from Eswood Turns. In my last video, I described a jig that I had for slicing segments down. And uh, I asked you for your feedback, and I got a lot of feedback. From the feedback, it's for sure that there's ideas for that jig, but a fair number of you preferred a bandsaw approach, primarily because the kerf is much thinner, which makes sense. But there's also a times to be able to cut a splitty ring while you're on the lathe. So in this video, I'm going to refine the jig from last week, but I'm also going to go up to my friend Frank Young's uh, shop and have him show us his techniques for cutting a ring on the lathe and on the bandsaw. And I think it's valuable because there's probably not one solution that fits everyone in every situation. The biggest variables are, well, what project are you on? What equipment do you have? And how good that equipment is? For example, my bandsaw doesn't really cut it. My table saw does. So I'll tend towards my table saw. Frank has a very good bandsaw. He tends towards the bandsaw, but he also uses the lathe. So it depends, and the more options you have, the better you can address any particular situation. So let's refine last week's jig and show some more alternatives in this video. Okay, we have a, a revolving chuck on this end, and it's on a ball bearing adapter. Okay, what I want to do, I've got a ring here made out of walnut, and I want to have a, an accent ring next to this maple. And so I want an accent ring that's going to be just a little bit over a sixteenth of an inch thick. So I'm going to part it off with it spinning here. And the advantage of having this is this isn't flying off and going bouncing around the shop. And it's glued onto this side. So when I'm ready to put this onto the next ring, all I have to do is true up this surface and it's good to go. So you can build a vessel from both sides. I do all of mine from both sides. And then the advantage if you're doing a hollow vessel, you can build from both ends and have it all hollowed out and then join it at the equator when you're done. Could you split it three ways? Oh, any way you want, yeah. That's the advantage of segmented. You've got the options of your imagination is what you can do. <laughs> okay, I'm going to use a little tool that I made. And well, I'm, Tell I'm, us about that tool. Okay, this, this is a bread and butter knife I got from the Goodwill. It's stainless steel and it's tapered. And it holds a good edge. 32nd of an inch thick at the fat edge. Up here at the top, it's probably a 64th less than that. But I'm, I've got it ground so that it's cutting just a little bit up from the bottom. Does a great job, yep. Okay. And I think I've got. This is a piece of brass I had left over, and a piece of wood I had left over. I've got about a dollar in that. Widening it out just a little. <laughs> yeah. 
here. So you really didn't need a long parting tool either because you're only cutting through the segment. Through the ring. ring. Yep. So that's a good job. Take it apart and show us the surface. Now you will clean that up a little bit more. I was fattening it on this side. See that? I made it a little heavy so that I, I wouldn't pinch in the blade. This side over here that I'm saving is almost ready to sand right now. So what have you got into this, money-wise? Okay, I'm going to pop it on. Okay, this, this is a check that I got on sale from Woodcraft, and it was about $89 for that check. And it came with these jaws. I bought this unit here from uh, Penn State. And I think it was around $29 for that. And it fits right into that chuck. It's an eight, one by eight thread. And then you also have your standard uh, faceplate that you use. Faceplates I make out of wood. Okay. Now I, I use uh, threaded wood faceplates, which is about the same concept. Yeah. The reason I like these is I'm in and out of the lathe all the time when I'm building my boxes. When I'm building a box, I may be in and out of the lathe 20 or 30 times. And this way I'm assured of registration and it's quick. Okay, in order to make uh, this work right, you have to have this adjusted right. It needs to be in this fence needs to, er, support needs to be at 90 degrees. And the distance needs to be parallel to this back edge of the saw of the sled. And then the other adjustment we need is we need to have the blade perpendicular to the table. Make sense? Now, Frank, how have you mounted your chuck to the wood? Okay. <clears throat> I use a uh, reducer that you can get from, uh, I got this one from Penn State because that's the cheapest place to get them, but that reducer all of my chucks are inch and one half, eight threads per inch. The reason I have these is because they fit my metal lathe and then I adapt them to fit my wood lathe. But those adapters are available to almost any chuck. Any, any chuck. And so this fits into there. So what I do is I have a, actually just a chunk of brass I put. It's just a spacer, isn't it? Yeah, just so that it tightens down. And then I tighten it down super tight so that there's no movement in it. Well, that seems quite adequate because I know that inch and a quarter eight bolts are really rare and expensive. So just an adapter is available and can work. Yep, and then it's multi-purpose. You, no. you can use the adapter on your lathe. Okay. Okay, here we go. One of the advantages of having it this way is you don't get the spinning action. When you cut with a bandsaw and you cut something round, that blade will grab it and spin it right out of your hand. So this way it holds it from spinning and that cut is within five thousandths of true. 
Now, some people wondered why you even split a ring in the first place. Why not just mill the stock down and then to thin and then glue up the rings? So what's, what's your take on that? Depends if you like to glue rings. Here's one that I made. I made this out of two rings and I cut them down. And so I've got eight rings and I made out of two glue ups. And what's really neat with this one is I cored it and so I got three boxes out of that glue up. And but you like the, the look of the thin rings with this also. On this particular one, it depends on what you're making. I mean, this one, I wanted to have something to go with this burl. And I thought thin rings would go well with that burl. When I do multiple glue ups on my boxes, I'll glue up a red heart ring, then I'll split it and put them together. It, sa it just saves time. And normally when I'm doing a box like this, I'll make two boxes at once. That way I'm not really doubling my time. I'm just maybe half and again my time and I can make two boxes. So you can make two boxes in the... About, these take about 40 hours to make two boxes. Now with this rig here, what's the, the, it looks like the maximum you can cut is what, about 8 to 10 inches? It depends on this. This has got a 13 inch throat. So you, so you, you could do bigger, but I'd have to make a new, new carriage to carry them. And, and this one here, I've gone up to 8 inch with this one. Okay. And those outriggers are primarily to keep it from tipping. Yeah, to keep it from tilting when there's a lot of pressure on this. And it's simple to make. And, uh, and what I like is after cutting it, it goes right back on the lathe. Oh, from Vance out of the lathe. Yeah. Okay. And what do you use for face plates? What are you holding that with? I make glue blocks. All my glue blocks have a tenon on the bottom. And what I like about the tenon is I can take them in and out of the lathe and they're always in register. Uh, and when you're doing woodworking, it might be off two thousandths, but two thousandths is nothing when you're doing woodworking. So, and in this case, I don't even take it in and out of the chuck. That's just going to go right back in the lathe. So it doesn't matter the size of your chuck, it just matters that you're consistent between your machine. That's true. I've made a couple of modifications to the sled, but first the things that stay the same. One, I like this setup for the smaller rings, and that smaller ring is anything that I can't get on this bolt. Uh, but it gives me good pressure clamping in the middle between wood up here and this ring down here to be able to safely cut a ring, a small ring. But for larger rings, I've made a couple of changes based on the feedback. First and foremost, I have measured the maximum depth that my saw blade can go and I've drawn a line on my jig for that depth. And the hole that was below that point, I have plugged so that I cannot put a ring through there. So the lowest bolt is going to always be above that by a comfortable margin. Then, uh, with that, I think it then mount a ring with a clamp basis. Since you found good curve cables will come later, I've made a couple more because I needed more more chances for it. Then the other thing that was of concern was how close my hand was to the saw blade. And so uh, I found a couple of these that I had laying around the shop, which are mag blocks of some sort. Uh, and they go in a hole here on this. This board is also the maximum height of my saw blade can go. So at this point now I'm going to put that next to the blade engage the magnets and so my hand cannot go beyond that and uh, since 
and not below this, so I think I'm good. So let's go ahead and cut this ring. Wait for the blade to stop, just treat it as if it's a rattlesnake. Don't go near it. Then I took it, uh, when I demonstrated before, I took, took, made it too loose. So at this point, I'm going to say, well, I'm just going to cut it too. And I think I don't, don't think I need a curve keeper yet. It's two. Loosen to about there, I think we'll do. Probably need a curve keeper now, at least on this side. Sharper blade would probably help. Curve keeper. Main reason for labeling the curve keepers is that they don't wander off and get into the scrap bin. Oops. And with that, I just got one more. Right here we'll probably do get your curve keeper. That one may get chewed up, but that's okay. Two rings. Do have some cleanup. Those are good.